University of Strathclyde, and I'd like to uh, share with you some insights about how we can construct models that uh, go beyond just models of the epidemics and why we might like to do this. Um, before I start, I would like to apologize for not being here in person today. Um, I'm on strike, as are many of my colleagues. This strike is about pensions, where we're being asked to pay more and get less, um, based on a uh, dubious pr prediction of the future, um, and also uh, casualization and working conditions and uh, and so on, which uh, all of which conspired to make a career in academia somewhat less um, attractive than it once was, which is a problem, in fact, for um, well, it's a problem because it reduces the uh, it reduces the quality of the work that's done in the in in academia as people leave and we have less good people, and you know uh, perhaps this uh, this is even relevant to work on studying infectious diseases and the and the and the pandemic as people as as we have fewer good people to be doing this because the deal is not so good as it once was and um, it. Um, yeah, we'd like this to uh, we'd like this to improve. Um, right, okay. So, epidemics of human disease seem to be uh, human to human disease, right? I mean, as opposed to uh, vector-borne diseases, we're thinking of diseases like the COVID. Um, most, but not not all, but most um, uh, epidemic models have at their core a single kind of interaction. Right, this is an interaction between a susceptible individual and an infectious individual, and they come together, and out of this interaction come two infectious individuals. Um, this can be, of course, elaborated in various ways. Right, we can consider different kinds of individuals, different ages, different uh, different sexes, different um, different demographic categories. Um, we might uh, imagine a um, we might imagine that we um, treat the individuals as a um, large continuous population if we decide to take a chemical reaction point of view of this sort of thing and we arrive at compartmental models or we could consider the individuals really individu as, as individuals and model them specifically each and every one and uh, we get agent-based models like this we can do things in between as well where we get the kind of bilinear map stratified models um, other things too like um, like um, you know branching processes and so on and so forth but when it comes down to it the um, fundamental thing is an interaction that looks something like this right um, we also have disease progression but these are not interactions these are just progression of disease spontaneous transitions of individuals as the infectious individual recovers and becomes relieved and you can see the sweat dripping from the forehead and very happy relieved um, we can have other spontaneous trans transitions, of course. I mean, often there's a there's a there's a latent phase before the infectious phase. Um, infectious phase may be split into several different kinds, where there are symptoms or no symptoms or severe symptoms, and so on and so forth. And further, you know, further on to like you know being hospitalized or not being hospitalized, and so on. We may even have transition that goes back from ostensibly having recovered from the disease to being uh, to being susceptible again all of these things are important to study and, and and quite useful to study however I want to focus on the interaction and <coughs> pardon me and um, you know how it is useful to consider this is not only is it useful but it's possible to consider um, more than one kind of interaction what do I have in mind when I'm talking about this? You know, we have epidemic models. Each of these circle is, you know, meant to represent a model of some type formulated in some way. And we often ask, we have an epidemic model. How do we put behavior into it? And um, I think this is somewhat ill-posed if, uh, if, if you ask the question like that. Because what we really want to do is we want to ask, well, if we have a behavior model and an epidemic model, how we can put them together? Right, how behavior influences the epidemic, and how the epidemic itself influences behavior, and uh, it's 
fairly clear, it should be fairly uncontroversial, that this um, kind of feedback mechanism is something that exists, that is something that we observe in the world, right? We have changes in behavior, uh, perhaps caused by interventions, perhaps spontaneously by individuals taking their own precautions without being told to. This change, these changes in behavior change the trajectory of the epidemic. And as the trajectory of the epidemic develops, um, this also changes people's behavior, right? If Perhaps if cases are going very away, if cases are increasing very rapidly, then individuals take more precautions. And as cases are, cases are falling, uh, individuals take fewer precautions. So the epidemic influences behavior and behavior influences the epidemic. And I claim um, we can, in fact, make models of this. And in fact, we want to. And we have now, which we didn't, uh, at least not so much, when the, uh, when the COVID pandemic started, we have a lot of data. Um, it needs to be, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be analyzed in, uh, you know, which is not a, which is not a trivial thing, but we do have quite a lot of data about how people's behavior has been changing in response to these uh, changing circumstances, which means that it is, it seems at least within reach that we could start coming up with models for how the behavior changes rather than just treating it as a uh, phenomenologically as a measurement process. There's also uh, substantial literature of immune response models. Now, this is not a feedback loop, but it is. There is influence, at least between the immune response and the epidemic, right? Immune response governs how, how long people are infectious for, how some people become infectious for a long time, and some people become infectious for a short time, this kind of heterogeneity, which we'll see. Um, so uh, all of this arises from interactions in the um, and can be explained by from the interactions between uh, the virus and the various immune effectors and the functioning of the immune system. We'll see a little bit of this as well. And I also claim that this is this uh, considering this considering a coupled uh, immune model and epidemic model is a useful thing to look at because it provides an explanation of some of the phenomena that we see. But let's start with um, let's start with behavior. So here we got two kinds of um, two kinds of interactions. In fact, the first one you might imagine takes uh, to, you, know, you could you could gloss it as I go into a room. I go into a room and everybody else around me is wearing masks, and I'm going to feel some kind of social pressure to put a mask on, right? Because I don't want to be the only one not wearing a mask. And as well, the opposite may happen. Right, the opposite may happen. I go into a room. I'm wearing a mask, but nobody else is. You know, I'm going to also feel the odd one out, and maybe I want to take this off. So there's a kind of copycat behavior that we can kind of reasonably expect may happen, and they may happen at different rates. Right? I mean, it may be easier, socially easier, or psychologically easier to put on a mask than to take off a mask. We can choose what these numbers are, these rates, these mu and nu here. Um, but we can imagine there's Here's an interesting example of an interaction between individuals that is not about disease transmission, but will affect disease transmission. And not only that, but we want to couple this model. You know, it's written, written down in the same kind of representation. And we can, again, do all the different elaborate, uh, elaborate things. We can treat them as chemical reactions. We can, treat them as, um, we can treat them as rules, which turns out to be actually quite useful. Um, but I won't talk about in great detail what these uh, what what rules mean. Although many of the examples I'll give will uh, will use this kind of formalism. In any event, here are some interactions, and we can combine them with the interactions of infection. We can also have other kind of interaction here, right? We can imagine that um, the more infectious top one, the more infectious people there are around, the more somebody who's not wearing a mask is going to wear a mask. Right. This is you have some information that comes in, some information. Perhaps you watch the news and you see how cases change. Cases are going up. A lot of infectious people around. Well, I'm going to take some precautions, just as I said earlier. Right. I'm going to put on a mask or you might say, well, most people are now recovered. The epidemic has passed. There's no danger. Um, so I'm, I'm wearing a mask, but actually maybe I'm going to stop. So you can again choose constants for this and you can combine this with the um, original model. There's some detail to how you do that. This is small enough that you can, in fact, do as a compartmental model where you have 
you know, discrete compartments for each combination of individual, for each disease state and whether they're wearing a mask or whether they're not wearing a mask. This becomes a little bit cumbersome as we start adding features into the model, right? Because we could have, you know, we've got three disease states and wearing a mask and not wearing a mask. This is six compartments. Um, now, uh, what if we add sort of isolation in? Well, people can be isolating or not isolating. So now that's uh, for each of those is there's two states. So that's 12. Um, you know, we can uh, imagine that people are vaccinated or not, or they have zero, one, two, three, four. So that's four times 12 is what 48 compartments. As we add features in, um, it becomes uh, it becomes a little bit unwieldy and rule based models help with that. But if we do this, you know, we see we get some plausible sorts of results, right? We have, um, you know, in the the blue and the green and the red, uh, we have what looks like a standard epidemic trajectory. But we can also keep track of how many people are wearing masks, and we see that it rises. It rises quite quickly. It rises, you know, for some choice of parameters, rises to a fairly substantial level, and tails off actually quite quite slowly, right? So we can get. Um, a plausible picture of uh, what happens in reality in this case just by you know just by choosing values uh, this isn't fit to any data but it could be and it would be useful to do that sort of thing but this is an illustration it's just meant as an illustration of the kind of thing I'm talking about where we want to be able to compose together models of infectious disease transmission and models of behavior this was a simple model of behavior we can also do things like you know, this is a little bit more in um, you know a little bit more explicitly kind of rule based here. We can also do things like imagine we have finite resources. This has come up several times, right? Come up several times in the course of the pandemic where there were uh, a finite number of PCR tests that we could do because reagents were constrained and there's only so many PCR machines. Or, as I've written here, VX being vaccine. You know, there's a certain finite amount of vaccine. Uh, we don't have enough to go around, certainly in low and middle income countries. In the UK, we have, in principle, more than enough to go around, um, but uh, there are still supply constraints in time. And so perhaps we have a process that is manufacturing a vaccine. It could be more complicated than this one. This one, manufacturing, just says vaccines appear out of nowhere. But and you could have a whole supply chain that you know eventually results into a, into a vaccine. This could be more elaborate, but we could have a manufacturing process that creates discrete units of vaccine. And a unit of vaccine um, is created, and it's not bound. This was the um, the convention here with these small white circles. Is this is a site that can become bound or cannot become bound? It's filled in if it's bound. It's not filled in if it's not bound. And we can have, you know, a vaccine that hasn't been used. So how to read the second line, or and a person that has not had a vaccine, and at some rate we can give that vaccine to the person, and that vaccine becomes used, it becomes bound, right? It's not it's not available for use anymore. So we can have models that explicitly track resources, tests, vaccines, and so on and so forth, um, and um, that um, yeah that 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 model this. Uh, that model this explicitly and allow us to have, um, you know, some way of treating the situation where there are, um, there where there is constrained supply, right? You have to do this in a discrete setting. You can't really do this against in a continuous setting because, um, you know, because it doesn't make sense. You know, half a person gets a quarter of a vaccine. Um, maybe this makes sense in some sort of mean field way at a population level, but we can get a little bit more. Um, we can do a little bit better than that here, especially if there is a constant population of vaccines, constant population, constant number of vaccines, right, or tests or whatever. Say we have a thousand vaccines and you've got 10,000 people, well, we want to allocate them to a thousand of the people, not to not sort of, you know, smear over a tenth of a vaccine over the whole population. You can do this in discrete simulation in a rule-based way as we, you know, as we see here. I'm not going to uh, belabor this particular example. Um, but um, uh, this is mainly intended to show the kinds of illustrations that we'll use a little bit later and to explain the different parts, right? This, we call them agents, the vaccine, the person, and the agents have sites and the sites can have bonds. And we can take a representation of this that's almost one-to-one -one with what's on the screen and we can simulate this and we can see what happens and we can fit it to data and so on and so forth.
There was an interesting paper from Irina Pabst. Um, this is another example of how we can incorporate behavior. Interesting paper from Irina Pabst, where um, this is formulated, this is not the way it was formulated in that paper, but it's the way that I like to think about it, where there's two processes, right? One is run an epidemic. This is concerned with flu. Um, run an epidemic to steady state until it's finished, right? So you run an epidemic and uh, it gives you the final size and you have, uh, and you're, you know, you're left with so such and such a number of individuals are susceptible, such and such a number of individuals um, are recovered. And then the next step that makes a choice about vaccination. And they make a probabilistic argument where they construct an expression that says, um, you know, the likelihood of uh, getting vaccinated according to what has just happened in the epidemic, right? Um, arguments of the form that say, well, if, uh, if I didn't get vaccinated and I didn't get infected, then maybe I won't get vaccinated again. One that says I didn't get vaccinated and I did get infected, then I'm going to vaccinate next time. And, you know, and so on and so forth. And they make a prob probabilistic expression that says, uh, that, you know, sets up the initial conditions for the next cycle. So this is a one year cycle where an epidemic happens and people make choices for the vaccine. And we construct, construct the simulation step, step by simply composing. And in these cases, these are written down as propagators that compose sort of directly by function composition in this case, vaccine after epidemic. And this is one simulation step that represents one year. And they find for some choices of the parameter values in, their, in, in, in the epidemic and the choice function that if there is a cost to being uh, vaccinated, then uh, they get this interesting behavior where they get this oscillation about the herd immunity threshold. And that's interesting. And uh, this is not something that um, it's not something that I've seen elsewhere. Uh, and we can even go a little bit further. We can even go a little bit further by looking at, um, there was a paper in the Journal of the Royal Society Interface about 10 years ago, where um, these, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these, um, the authors, authors of the paper did a survey, a small survey, just in their department, or maybe it was in their university, I forget exactly. And they asked, why do people get vaccinated? Do you get vaccinated against influenza? Do you get vaccinated because you are um, at risk? Do you get vaccinated because you um, want to protect others around you? And they found out that about 20% of the respondents, um, about 20% of the respondents said they got vaccinated because uh, for altruistic reasons, because they want to help others, not because they thought there was any particular benefit to themselves. And if you add in to the choice function of the that uh, Pabst and colleagues had made an altruism term and you vary it, um, you find quite interestingly, you find that um, in order to get rid of these oscillations, you need uh, something between 20-25% um, uh, of altruism, which coincidentally anyways is the same as they found in that paper here. So I thought that is interesting and this again is a way that you can compose an epidemic model and a behavior model. I have a student who's done a, uh, a more elaborate version of this where the behavior model is based on it's a, Bayesian, um, a Bayesian behavior model where there's a prior belief about whether vaccination or not is beneficial or not. And this is updated according to what happens in their surroundings, in their immediate surroundings. It's in a network setting. Um, that's kind of in preparation. Uh, I'll talk about that in detail at some, uh, at some later point. But again, this is um, an example of a phenomenon that we see year on year. Um, we might see and how we can get some insight into this again by combining epidemic models and behavior models. Lastly, I'd like to show a, uh, an interesting result that we got with um, looking at immune response. Now, this is a very simple um, model of adaptive immune response, right? Where we've got virus replication, we've got um, affinity maturation of the B cells as the B cells become tuned to um, better match the virus. Um, we've got the B cells produce the antibodies and they produce antibodies proportionally to how, um, 
you know how well tuned they are how much uh, how much affinity for the virus they have and the antibodies neutralize this virus there's no um oh and of course recovery the virus gets down to zero and the virus population of that individual falls off um there's no innate response in this model it would be useful to add it but this itself is um uh, is 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 quite interesting and is enough to get an interesting uh, interesting result um, we can also compose this with a transmission model and this transmission model becomes very natural in this kind of setting where we have we don't have to separate it, people into arbitrary compartments of immune or um, you know recovered or susceptible or infectious we can just say that a susceptible individual is one with no established immune response to the virus and no virus and an infectious one is somebody, regardless of what the immune response is doing, is somebody with virus. And a recovered one mm, has no virus and uh, has an established immune response. You can read this off the bottom row by looking at the binding sites and saying whether they are bound or whether they are not bound. You know, again, bound is going to be filled in, not bound is going to be, um, is going to be um, not filled in. And then the transmission rule becomes very simple. Right? The transmission rule is here is a person and they've got some virus. They have an amount of virus and we imagine that the transmission rate is proportional to how much virus they have or proportional in this case to the logarithm of how much virus of the size of the viral population because that's what the n is counting. Individual with virus meets individual with no virus and out comes an individual with virus and an individual with a little bit of virus and their immune system goes and does a thing. We don't need to think about recovered because if they're if they have previously been infected, well their immune, established immune response will clear the virus quickly. And if they haven't, it takes time for the established immune response to build. Now, if we run this and we look at the probability of having a particular viral load on the um, x horizontal axis of these figures, um we see something, uh, we see how the distribution of viral load in the population is expected to evolve. Um, and, you know, notice that as the probability mass moves to the right and then starts returning to the left, um, we end up with a small number of individuals after a long time with quite a high viral load. And we find, if we do the sums, we find that after about two weeks or so, the um, mass of viral load in the population um, is uh, exists in about you know something like eighty percent of the mass of the viral load in the population um, is in twenty percent of the population, and this is something that we also see from measurement. But we can produce this pretty much automatically just by fitting to some uh, fitting to some data that comes from the Siren study. And not only that, that if we now um, you know the previous one was everybody starting population of a thousand individuals all starting at the same time with the same, you know, viral load of one and seeing what happens. Now, if we run an epidemic and we run the coupled version with transmission, we can see how the viral load distribution in the population changes according to the state of the epidemic, whether it's early in the epidemic and it's rising, when people are being infected faster and faster, so we get more individuals with less viral load, whether it's later as the epidemic is rising, as it's about halfway up, at the peak, and as it's falling. And as it's falling, we have um, more and more people who are later in, their, um, in, their, uh, in the course of their infection. And this as well is something that's been observed in empirical data. And um, uh, yeah, and in fact can be used when you have uh, limited testing resources can actually be used to infer from the distribution that you get from viral load just by testing individuals at random, you can infer the, uh, the stage that the epidemic is at from the distribution you get, which is very interesting. But this essentially falls out naturally from this very, very simple model. And uh, thank you. That's, um, that's all I have to say for now. There's, I, I, there's, um, much more that I could talk about on in any of these different directions. If you'd like to contact me about any of this to ask questions or perhaps to collaborate because there's tons of fertile ground here for, um, you know, further developing this, especially the behavior models and developing methods for coupling models, please do send me an email. I'd be very happy to speak with you. And uh, thanks to 
funders and colleagues and providers of resources and of course the um you know of course the people who have developed the capital language which uh, without which a lot of this would have not been possible thank you very much